This episode of the Southern Hemisphere No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Curly's Ag. Curly's Ag has been in the business of developing and manufacturing innovative ag tools for the past five years. In that short time, they have amassed an impressive range of new and patented tools now readily available for you. Curly's Ag is home to the world's only commercially available battery drill-powered power harrow, as well as Curly's Cracker 2, an automatic broad fork making saw prep and ease in any condition. Curly's Ag is also known for the Elia 3000, a multi-purpose tilter, mulcher, and bed former all rolled into one, as well as the most recent and anticipated tool for every farm, the Handy. The Handy is redefining the market garden toolkit and taking the hard work out of farming. It can lift 300 kilograms with ease and smoothly manoeuvre over your garden bed without damaging crops. The Handy's PDO powers the Elia 6000, mulcher and tilter, a power harrow, an auger, a compost spreader, a harvester, and more attachments. If you like to know more, please jump on their website at curlyzag.com and feel free to contact them for more information. Curly Zag are distributing in the US and soon opening up in Europe. This episode is also brought to you by Activista. Activista's mission is to assist growers to develop soil-focused, diverse cropping systems with commercially viable seeds, appropriate equipment and soil inputs, and advice and feedback for all growers' current needs and particular situations. Activista is working diligently behind the scenes to maintain and develop their supply of seeds for profitable market farming. Small bulk quantities are at or near cost price. They have a non-GMO pledge and aim to source the best hybrid and heritage varieties to suit each segment and conditions of growers' needs nationally. Activista takes the battle out of importing specialized tools, providing sales and warranty support with all of their equipment range. They carry most, if not all, parts and have a direct line of communication with suppliers. Activista encourages customer feedback and gives personal attention to all inquiries as they see this process as a vital part of our vibrant, developing, organic community. Welcome back to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Southern Hemisphere Season. My name is Mikey and today on the show we have Rod Bruin of Summit Organics. A lot of market garden and vegetable growing content is based in farms growing in a range of temperate and Mediterranean climates. So I was really keen to have Rod on the show to share his years of experience growing quality organic vegetables in a a uniquely subtropical climate next to a stunning rainforest on the beautiful east coast of Australia. So this is a really lovely conversation and it flows at times like a story as Rod shares his, his journey with all the raw and honest ups and downs which honestly come with running and maintaining a farming business. And like I said, I really love hearing the perspectives of growers like Rod who who have years under their belt and and the way they reflect about farming is is really sober and thoughtful. So I hope you guys all enjoy the podcast and the chat as much as I did. But before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we talk today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening in today. Probably shouldn't be farming here. Tell me more. It's uh, very wet, very windy, (laughs) and and there there were times when I I thought, oh, I don't know what we're doing here. But we, we manage to pull it off and we get stronger for it, you know. It's, mm. it's just a matter of learning about your land. Yeah, and you guys have been growing there for, well, you've got some pretty good intimacy with the land compared to a lot of other young growers who've only been on there for a couple of years. You've been How long have you been on your site for? Oh, well, I've been here since I was 15, so 42 years. Wow, okay. So, okay, you've really, so you've really seen the changes probably that, you know, just, I guess they're saying that intimacy with the property, but also a lot of changes that have gone and happened to the place. And we've tried so many things. It was probably 20 years before we got an income, you know. Mm. And and I had to work away for a lot of years too, you know, to, because we borrowed money and, you know, had to pay that off. And yeah, so it's amazing though if you stick with it. Was was the so you said you you grew up since you were 15 on the farm? Was was it a family property? Well, yeah, my my brothers and my mum and dad bought the property when I was 15, and I remember coming out the first time because. Um, I'd actually broken my arm and I couldn't get out to see it, so I got to see it last. 
and I, I stepped on the farm and walked up the hill and overlooked the valley and I just thought, this is, this is the rest of my life. I just knew then... I just wanted to be here, you know. It's because it, it, you know, from all the from all the pictures that I've I've seen on your website and your, and your socials, it's it's magnificent. I, I was actually just on Google Maps as well. You're literally surrounded by by national park. It's unbelievable. We are, yeah, yeah, yeah and right on the Queensland border, there's nobody behind us. So that we're right on the. Uh, I think there's a hundred meters between us and the border, but it's probably three hundred meters straight up. Wow. So t- so tell me about that. So you, you're surrounded. What is it? What is it like? First of all, like you said you your family bought the property and it was it's it's like i said it's a very unique lo- location so you're in northern new south wales and you're surrounded by basically subtropical rainforest you know in a way or on mountain ranges that's right uh, it's about a thousand meter escarpment and it's actually the volcanic rim of mount warning and and we we look straight at the western side of mount warning wow. and we get to see the sun touch the tip of mount warning which is the first place in australia to see the sun it's a pretty amazing place. Unbelievable. And what, so what was, what was the original impetus for, for purchasing the properties? And I'd love to hear how, how essentially it came to be that you ended up farming on this property because from what I understand, it's, 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 it's large. It's 338 acres, which is not a small property. That's um, right. And were you guys always farming it? How did you get into this? How did you get into farming? I can go straight back to the, the very beginning, but basically... My father is from Holland, and in the war, he ended up, um, when he was 14, on a farm. Uh, basically, he left his food ration cards with his parents, who were in the city, and he made his way out to the farm, which wasn't too easy in the war. And he got to stay on a farm until the end of the war, and the farmer fed him. And providing he worked, that's what happened. You know, he, he got his food, so... But he, he always had this thing that when he went to Australia, he wanted to own a farm and, and he had this... He used to say to us, when, when the shit hits the fan, um, farmers live like kings because they have heaps of food and even though the Germans took all the food, there was always the farmers got first dibs and could have whatever they wanted, but the Germans took the rest. So, And then uh, when, when after a few years, they actually got some, you know, they... they basically decided on this property and it was in the late 70s with the threat of nuclear war and all that stuff and there was a big return to the land sort of thing you know people wanted to be self-sufficient and it was a time and exactly the same time Bill Mollison and and um, permaculture and they wrote their first books David Holbrook and, and the, an English book self-sufficiency so I sort of grew up reading those books and was so excited to come here and and start things, um, but but in reality, when we got here, it was so much tougher. <laughs> you know, you got all these ideas, but it's a different climate and a different different sort of place, and it doesn't work so well. But so we we tried a lot of things. I think we had two hundred goats arrive from from uh, Western Queensland came here, and and a lot of them were in kid, and then we had five hundred and two mils of rain. And, and uh, we, we had terrible time. We lost a lot of those animals and, and it was really tough times for the whole family. And my brothers ended up going back to their original jobs. I can't blame them. Yeah, it's farming is, I think, as you said, like sharing that is interesting how it's, you know, we're some 40 years, 40, 50 years on from there. And there's, you know, there has been a sort of revival again of that back to the land in a certain way. I think there's obviously been different different causes and reasons behind it. But it's it's interesting reflecting on, like you're saying, your 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 folks and you guys originally having this 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 desire to go back to the land, which a lot of us do, and and also and then once you do get it and you get back to living this different life, there's a stark reality check of kind of it's it's not it's not what it's written in the books, and it's not as always as ideally as we were hoping. That's right, and, and the information was wasn't as readily available uh, even when we first became uh, certified organic, which was probably about thirty years ago now. Um, there, there was no one around um, to to talk to. You know, it, we had to travel a long way. You know, our first market we started to do was in Lismore, which was an hour and 40 minutes drive. And uh, if it wasn't for that market, because uh, the other stallholders and that there were pretty good, you know, and, and just talking to them and we learned so much from them and that, that was our 
highlight for the week to drive down there and sell our produce and, and uh, have this um, place where we could, you know, talk to people who are like-minded because up here they all thought we were crazy trying to do organics. Could you also share a little bit of context just so that everyone listening in can um, get a bit of a picture about where exactly in terms of that climate? Because like you're saying, if back if back then there was X much you know amount of information, you know now as you said we're very privileged to have we've got YouTube channels, we've got podcasts like this, there's books going on, um, and even it's interesting that a lot of the stuff that that we also talk about on the show also comes from usually it comes from a temperate and a cool temperate environment, and I think that's also such an interesting part of the story is that not only are you guys obviously trying to set something up back in the 70s onwards but you're also doing like you said in a in a in a climate which was very different than probably whatever material was available at the time as well yeah that's right there's a little lot of um, very little information i mean even like when we did the goats we were trying to farm animals that were from out west and like that drier climate so we soon learned that didn't work um you know like we live right on the the escarpment here it catches the southeast uh, onshore winds so basically the rain comes in off the ocean and uh, it, it can't carry over the top of the mountain so it dumps on us like it's it's nothing to get a cloud burst here 40 or 50 mil in, in half an hour or four. Uh, we, we can get we can get um, 300 mils in 24 hours well wow. um, two, 200 mil in 24 hours would probably happen once every summer um, and and we're also farming on the hills, probably five, five to twenty degrees slope most of the time. So, um, with that high rainfall, you know we listen to a lot of people and people talk about swales and keeping the moisture in the ground. Uh, all we tried to do here is get rid of the water. That's that's number one. Drains don't try and um, uh, any any excess water from outside the paddock, so make sure everything's drained. You just want to deal with the water that lands on on your on your growing area and nothing from outside of that. Yes, yeah, so it's a totally different climate. Uh, lots of thunderstorms, hail, and and because we live in the mountains, we get these crazy swirling winds. So you can literally drive two k's down the road and there'll be no wind and drive up here and it's gale force and uh, extremely loud. You know, sometimes I work with the earmuffs when I'm picking because it's so noisy. I'm just keen on, on hearing all, and in terms of also the, the temperature, what sort of temperature ranges are you guys getting there in the, in the winter and the summer? Yeah, so, yeah, we get... Um, the, the winters are brilliant. Like, once our wet season's over, uh, sometimes we can get an autumn that uh, lingers a little bit wet. In our planting time, it can be difficult to plant if that rain lingers. But once the wet season's over, we have a really wonderful, stable sort of growing season. And because we're 240 metres above sea level here, it's above the frost, so we only get the worst of a touch, a touch of frost in the worst of the you know, cold weather, So, which has really been a bit of a niche for us here because when a lot of the other growers slow down in that mid-winter period we we keep harvesting a bit more we seem to be about a month off everybody else yeah really handy which would have been super interesting as you're saying for you to growing up in the place and and starting like you said you were visiting the farmers markets you were kind of picking up some you know some ideas here and there learning from those guys what were some of you know what what you said you were trialing also you know you were listening to these other growers you were practicing stuff you were bringing in all sorts of goats and various things. What was some of the, the stuff that then ended up leading? What were some of the things that you were trialling that were either really working well, that were ticking boxes and other things on your property, which you were saying, mm, not not really working for us, and that was leading you kind of step-by-step step forward to, to where you are today? Well, well, I remember reading a lot of the... The Department of Agriculture was quite good back in those days, and they used to have a lot of brochures. And, and small crops were, were also... Well, they were called small crops then you know, small crops and uh, cash crops. So it wasn't uncommon for people to put a patch of something in just to get some cash. So uh, really out of desperation, um, I was working on a dairy down the road and and 
in quite a bit of debt and had to make repayments and I thought, well, I'm never going to get out of debt like this. So I put a few vegetables in up here on top of the hill and um, they did all right, but then I got this massive wind and it sort of destroyed a lot of stuff. So that, that's when I thought, well, I've got to go away and earn some money. So we ended up, uh, I went away and did a lot of seasonal work for about 13 years, picking apples and pears and uh, tomatoes and all sorts of things. And that's how I met my wife. I was actually picking um, oranges, a little town called Narromine in the central west, New South Wales. And uh, I think I think that was good for us, all those years of uh, doing piecework and seasonal work and seeing different farming operations and stuff. So we returned home and we'd, we'd paid the loan off and then we also had enough money to build a house because I didn't want to try and start farming again without, um, you know, having a home to live in because I thought if I have to borrow for that, that'll be just be so difficult to start farming and pay off another loan. And So we did that. We built our house and, and timed it all good family planning, you know, just as the kids started had two kids and uh, we were growing coffee in the early days because subtropic climate we got into coffee my father was pretty keen on that uh, and he'd had he'd had um, prostate cancer so he was really keen to do organics that's how we got into that yeah i i was i was looking over your website and when i stumbled across that you were growing coffee i kind of i did a backflip because i i it, it's something I, I just, first of all, I'll absolutely love drinking <laughs> coffee. Everyone knows, people that know me, I have every gadget under the sun. And I read it, you guys were growing, or, you know, it, it wasn't that you were growing coffee. From what I understand, you guys were actually the first certified organic coffee producers and processors in, in the country. Yeah, we did the whole lot, like right through the processing, all the way through roasting. And then we did a lot of mail order, which was, back in those days, mail order was a big thing, you know. Uh, we used to send the coffee all over Australia. But the biggest problem was there's so much processing involved in coffee and so many steps along the way, and even us as professional pickers, we just we just couldn't. You know, when, when we worked out how much an hour we were making for the time we were putting in, it was it just didn't add up. So, you know, so then we had to make another huge decision you know, I said to my wife, because we had two young kids, but we weren't making enough and we were living in poverty pretty much. So I just said to Tanya, look, I might have to uh, go away and work again. And then one day I walked out to the, one of the sheds and up on top of the shelves, there was about two or 300 wax foxes, sweet, sweet potato cartons that had been given to my brother about 20 years earlier by my neighbour. And I remember my brother said, look, this guy paid off half his farm with sweet potatoes. So I came back in and I said to my wife, you know, I tell you what, I said, how about I put a patch of sweet potatoes in and if it doesn't work, I'll go away and work and, you know, you stay at home with the kids and I'll go away for six or eight weeks at a time. And so I did that and um, they went really well. And they're, they're you know pretty good subtropical crop as well. They grow in the tropics and subtropics. And uh, I didn't know where the hell we were going to sell them, Ike. <laughs> I came home one day and my wife said, oh, the Lismore Organic Market's looking for new growers. They've only been going about six months and maybe we should give that a go. And I, and I said, oh, you reckon? Like, I can't see we'd do much good, you know, going to a market. She said, oh, I think we should give it a go. And I said, all right. So we actually loaded up some coffee and sweet potatoes and the kids and uh, went down there. I think we took I think we took a woofer with us as well. We had a woofer at the time. And went down there and, and we turned over $360 in the morning. And I thought, wow, you know, cash straight in the hand just for a morning's work. And um, that was probably the turning point for us. Which is interesting because it almost it almost goes back to that original idea that you guys had as a family was to go back, live on the land, live a very different sort of life, and 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 grow your food, and then here you are, x many years later, after 
years of picking, which which interesting. Even the idea you're sharing before of picking, you know, um, I, I think I've always had to take my hats off to pickers. It's some of the hardest work out there. And I think anyone who's slogged out a good number of years in the picking industry, picking fruit, you've set yourself up with a work ethic to come into market gardening, ha- hands down. Well, you, you, end, you end up like a machine, Mikey. <laughs> completely, completely. You go out in 40-degree heat and work 12 hours a day and you just end up like a machine. Yeah, completely. No, no I know. I've got, a, I've got a mate of mine, Jay, who came and worked on the farm and he came from years of picking picking um, fruit and then he was also picking um picking flowers down in down in Tasmania and he came to the farm. It was funny because all these tasks that no one wanted to do, like pick beans and pick peas, snap peas, were his favourite yeah. tasks. And he'd go out there and he had a big smile on his face and we were just like we were laughing <laughs> our head off. Because you know, it's just a very different different mentality for, for, for growing and, and working. Yeah, it's it's such a disciplined thing to do and uh, and it's all about putting negative thoughts out of your head and just keeping on that one track and and just setting up your whole your whole existence, your meals. You have to be really organised, you know, like to do that sort of stuff professionally. And it, st- it stood us in good stead. And even on the farm, it was probably what made us. And, you know, there were a lot of crops that we, we worked out really quick how to pick them efficiently and how to manage them so that you come back and get more. And, and, and those skills we've been able to teach to our guys to teach them how to pick and because it's it's an overlooked part of growing. Picking is such a it's kind of where it makes or breaks the crop. You know what I mean? Like um, it's 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 a much bigger bigger um, thing than people realise. You have to be able to pull those bunches off in a certain time frame, or it's not worth doing. For sure. And like you were like you were sharing before, specifically in the context of Australia, where you've got high labour. Like you're saying before with the coffee, just when you ran the numbers on on picking coffee, and there's no surprising, it's not like not surprising that you know most of the large coffee producing countries are in areas where labour at this point is is very yep. cheap, which makes it affordable, um, essentially as a crop for everyone else to purchase. So, like you're saying, it's that labour cost. And then if and then if not, they have the if not, they have the machines, you know. But then you've got to have the flat ground, and so yeah, it's a big thing. For sure. Well, I'd love to. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear what were some of the things that you brought into then into your operation. You know that thinking, that mindset around efficiencies of and speed of picking that you translated to your workers to make things more, yeah, make things faster and, and more efficient. Yeah, just that, a lot of just the whole picking thing. You know, when we rock up to the shed, you know, everyone's got their. We were doing this twenty years ago, but people people had their. their like a nail bag type thing or, you know, waistband and you had all your your stuff in it and your rubber bands and your secretaires and your knives and uh, to be organised and then just like a a really good pick list with people's names with all the block block numbers listed on them and uh, we'd, we'd load up the utes with crates and everyone, like, you know, when people got here, they grab that, they're on the utes, you know, crates are in the back. We go down to the picking shed in the middle of the paddock, and Tanya would, Tanya would stick a um, a list on there with everybody's names and the blocks and the numbers that were expected from them, and just the whole, uh, you know, the process of it and the machinery to get it smooth. You know, like Tanya knows, she knows um, personalities of the pickers and. You know that most guys are better off doing silver beef and kale and the bigger stuff, and the girls are heaps better at the fiddly stuff. And um, you know how many bunches to give someone. Uh, you know if you've got fifteen hundred or two thousand bunches to get off in a morning, and you've got seven workers, she's really good at giving the right amount of bunches to people so that they all finish on time. You know and. People know they've got to go when they finish their list and they tick their names off their list. They've got to go and help, you know, everybody else so we all have smoko together. Because on our farm, no one gets smoko until the, the, the stuff's up at the shed. Okay, so until things are coming up, no one's having a smoking break or a, a little lunch break. Yeah, no, that's right. And every everyone knows, you know, that's the most important time. And we get up there at ten or it might be ten thirty. Um, the sooner we get up there, the sooner we get lunch. Or smoker, you know. Well, I, I've I'm 
I'm also I'm cognizant of the fact that you and I, because we're having a we're having an enjoyable yarn, we're jumping back and forth, and I'd love like now it's amazing. We were, we were touching on before that you you just rocked up and sold your your coffee and sweet potatoes, which brings me a big smile to my face thinking about someone rocking up to the farmer's market with those two, with those two crops. Like seeing that, at least seeing someone down where I'm from coming up <laughs> to market with coffee beans and a sweet potatoes would give me a good laugh. And now we're jumping forward and you're talking about having, you know, seven, eight staff running around the fields picking 1,500 to 2,000. It's amazing. Like what, what was the step between the two, those two parts of the story? It's been such a long journey and so much growth and, and I think that's what I'd like your listeners, to, like especially new listeners and, listeners and young farmers, it doesn't always come the way you expect it and you've got to be open to change. I think that's been our secret here. It, you know, you've got to be open to change and, and always changing because things change. So um, we we... Like, we did the one market in Lismore, and then we ended up doing another one on the Gold Coast, and then uh, then I all of a sudden, after 10 years, I just couldn't do Lismore anymore. I literally woke up one morning, I was like, I can't, I just can't go down there anymore. I'm over it. It's too far. So then I started box delivery, and uh, I had had all these drop-off points on the Gold Coast where I'd deliver boxes to. And I had this thing where, you know, you had to have these hubs of five or ten boxes, and if you could create a hub, I'd drop off there. And uh, so we did that for a while, but you know, I just found that too much work, too much book work, paper work, because you're going back. There wasn't, we weren't so computerised and, and frustrating, and vegetables don't have holidays, and... People who buy boxes do, and it was just difficult. So then we uh, tried another market, and back in those days, it was really hard to be organic in a conventional market. We really struggled to compete. Why was that? Is that because of is that because of people had a lack of awareness at that time of what organic was, or was it the price point you you had maybe crops that were dearer and people weren't willing to pay for it? Yeah, there was there's. A lot of the markets back then were not too authentic and a lot of people buying cheap produce from the markets and selling it really cheaply. Um, and it, there was, um, we were a little bit dearer, but not too much. Sometimes we were cheaper in some things, um, but people didn't understand. A lot of people, pe- sometimes people, you know, I remember guys walking past sometimes and just going, oh, mm. You know, like they wouldn't even come into your store. So it was different, you know. It was different. So I've digressed. You're going to have to get me back on track. <laughs> 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 no, nah, that's right. We were talking essentially, like you're saying, you, you, your, your, these early stages, there was, there was obviously some evolutions. You'd woken up. It was the Lismore Market. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So then we ended up doing another market and um, it had a, I can't remember. It was on the Gold Coast, and it had a an organic section in a conventional market, and that wasn't too bad. But and then, um, but it, it wasn't that profitable. And then, um, then I actually got a phone call from a from a market manager, and and she said to me, "Look, we'd really like to have you at our market." and uh, I said, oh, look, I don't know if I really want to do any more markets because we're doing it. I've got one good market and the other one's not so good and I don't know if I've got the time, you know. And she's like, oh, look, someone's left and they grow a lot of the crops you grow and, and he's put your name forward and um, we, we really would like you to come to this market. And I said, well, look, you're very convincing and I said, we'll, we'll, we'll come, but... Uh, if it's no good, I, I can't promise I'll stay. And we went down there and we, we did really well on the first day. And I thought, oh, this is all right, you know. And then uh, after I'd been there about six months, they have twin markets. It's up on the north northeast corner here, uh, Mullumbimby and New Brighton. They have twin markets. And then they asked me to if I'd be prepared to do the other one and I said to my wife, well, we'll give that a go. And I went over there and it was it was quite good too. So 
that was a huge turning point to get those other two markets that were really well. And, th and they were conventional markets, but there's a good organic awareness in that part of the state. So that changed everything because I still didn't own the farm and my brothers were really keen to get paid out their share and my parents had passed away in the meantime. So um, we started negotiations a couple of years before but I just kept stalling because we, we weren't earning enough. And um, with those two extra markets, we were able to um, buy my brothers out which was a huge step for us. And then a couple of years later, then we, we, the same thing happened. I was invited into our local market in our local town, which I'd always wanted to get into, but because uh, we we didn't have enough produce at, when they opened it, I, I missed out. Like you have to sort of be there when they open these markets, otherwise it's really hard to get in. Yeah, yeah, completely. There's a there's I, I know from chatting with a lot of a lot of growers and, and myself as well in our business that they're. Finding yeah, finding your feet in a market and in a good one because exactly selling at a farmers market is one thing, but having enough foot traffic to come through and to be be doing the majority of their produce shopping with you can literally be the make or break of like you're saying of your business. No, I, I really hear that. So the other the other thing, Mikey, because you've just reminded me because we do four markets now, but in that interim stage when we were doing Lismore, the market down there. Of course, our turnover wasn't... It was the first market in the area, the very first organic market in Australia. And we weren't making much. I was actually making more dropping off to shops on the way. So we had a dozen shops that we used to supply a week, um, like, yeah, vegetable shops. And then but, but the farm was growing and we were getting better. So we, we were sending to Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane vegetables, herbs, you know, like parsley and rocket, and, um, mint. We used to do 800 bunches in, in Melbourne every week. Um, yeah, I, I was actually going to ask you as well, just to get an understanding of at that time when you were going to the farmer's market and dropping off, what was what was your crop list? What were you growing? Because like 800 bunches of, of, did you say mint, did you say? Yeah, mint. Yeah, mint was massive. Yeah, it's a very big, big mint order, and I'd be keen to hear. Yeah, were you were you still growing sweet potatoes? What was were you still growing coffee? Yeah, we were still doing sweet potatoes, and we were still doing things um, for the market, and we were basically just learning off the growers in in the Lismore market, and and learning back there. I sort of had an agreement with some of the growers that if they told me how they grew stuff, that I wouldn't bring it to that market. And, and some of the guys were really helpful, you know, and so I, I would learn how to grow that stuff and then take it to another market. And then years later, when they'd drop out, they'd say, well, look, you can bring it now because I'm leaving. Um, but we were also, things that I learned that were, went well in the market, I would ring the agents in Sydney and say, have you heard of uh, European spinach before or, you know, <laughs> different vegetables? And they'd be like, no, no, like, what is it? And I'd, I'd send some down, I'll send a box down and they'd try it and then I'd be selling, you know, vegetables that they hadn't really heard much about. Was that, was that a, did you, did you say Egyptian spinach then? Uh, Egyptian spinach and I was sending Kang Kong and European spinach and oh, wow. all sorts of stuff they hadn't heard of or those, those guys. Anyway, to the organic um, wholesalers. And I was sending uh, all the sweet. We end up we were selling um, a pallet load of sweet potatoes a week down there too. And we were washing them. This is this was just my wife and I in the early days, but we were washing them by hand, <laughs> just with sponges. I remember. <laughs> oh, we were desperate to just. I'm sure you've come a long way since then. You know. So, but as time rolled on, we. Um, yeah, so I suppose, because a lot of people say to me, oh, it's all right for you, mate, because you're in all these markets. And I said, well, it wasn't always like that. So we had to start, you know, very small in the market. I did, you know, we, we sold more on the way to the market than at the market. And, and most of our business was actually sending to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. But that's where I learned the power of the markets and, you know, the cost of freight and then your agent's fees and, We'd be sending, you know, coriander, massive amounts of coriander down there, and a lot of herbs, parsley, and 
uh, spring onions, all, all that sort of stuff as well. And then sometimes the coriander would get down there and it all spoilt in the box and they'd say, well, we had to throw it out. And, but yeah, yeah, it was interesting times. We learned a lot. Yeah, no, com- completely. And I'm fascinated to hear some of the other the other crops that you were growing out there because I, I, you have on your website your your list of, of crops that you're currently growing, which is it's it's super broad and it's it's amazing because there's a good chunk of it which is you know they're they're crops that are quite commonly grown in a, in a lot of in a lot of areas being you know temperate mediterranean but then you also do have these these other very specifically you know subtropical crops that you grow in there like you said you've got you know gingers yeah. turmeric galangal you've got um kang kong um are they are they things that are still selling well i'm i'm fascinated to hear yeah. how you fell yeah. into yeah look it's a it's a very minor me, Mikey, because we're talking about the subtropic tropic in the context of it. So our biggest problem here is summer, and and so if you can imagine, we we earn all our money in six okay. to eight months of the year, basically, and and the rest of the time it was always really well, really really tough because too much rain and you just can't you can't get rid of the water. So and the humidity and the disease. And insect pressures, bloody amazing up here. And then sometimes you just get so much rain that you just watch your whole vegetable patch slowly die. Sometimes I think hail's better because you get wiped out and the sun comes out the next day and you can plant again. But here you can get six or eight weeks, sometimes 12 weeks of just continuous rain. Like, I literally mean like every day it can just rain. Unbelievable. Which is essentially not only preventing you getting into the field to working, but it's also, as you're saying, it's it's com- it's slowly compacting your soil in many ways and making it very difficult for your plants to be growing and photosynthesizing. Yeah, and the, and one of the biggest things when it's real bad is you get this stench and your biology and your worms float to the surface and your biology is actually drowning in the soil. Um, sometimes after a major flood event. It takes a good six weeks for things to start to crank again, even with our soil, and our soil is pretty good now. So the biggest challenge for us was to keep staff and and pay the bills through these summer months. So that was sort of our our mission. Like we, we it was like to survive here, we have to grow, you know, sweet potatoes and these tropical type vegetables, and try and get people to eat them. And um, after one flood, I remember we'd get a flood, we'd get wiped out, and it was like, quickly, plant radishes, we'll have something to sell in four weeks. <laughs> mm. You know, like, and then that year I was like, oh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do some microgreens. And, th- you know, you're talking 15, 16 years ago, there wasn't a lot, a lot of people doing them back then, but... Um, we started to do a few microgreens and because it was something we could do in, in summer undercover um, and, and earn some income. So, and then we, I remember reading um, Elliot Coleman's books, you know, and I was amazed at how he could grow all these crops when it was, there was snow outside. So I thought, I was always thinking, how can we, you know, what can we do about this bloody rain? There's got to be something. So that's when we started to, to grow in a few tunnels. And uh, I just, because of some other business we were involved in years before, I had this old um, four metre wide tunnel. I started to grow some tomatoes in it through the summer and just kept some records. And then I tried a few other things in there too, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Like, at least we had something to sell when we, when we could keep the rain off. So then I built two um, six by twenty meter tunnels, and we put tomatoes in them in the, in the winter because then I learnt that you know if you're warm because we don't get frost up here and you have a tunnel, you're that little bit warmer again and. Tomatoes did quite well through the winter, and then they those two tunnels paid for another six tunnels. Yeah, so then then we started to get all our Asian vegetables and lettuces and rocket in the tunnels through the summer. But we have the sides open, 
about one, 1 1.8 high with um, shade cloth because of the wind. I'd love to leave them open because we get such terrible wind, I can't. And, uh, yeah, so that was all right. But, you know, you know how it works. You fix one problem and create another one. And then we got all sorts of aphid problems in there and uh, mites and stuff. And then we had to start to do biological controls. And so that became another journey in itself. But I think we've got about 26 by 30 metre tunnels now. Wow. Yes, you can see some of your amazing drone footage recently. You guys yeah. posting your socials, it flies over, and you can really get a, kind of a, a visual, a visual farm. And it seems like I just, I just love the fact that like you're sharing that you're reading, you know, an Elliot Coleman book, which is written from someone in the in northern hemisphere in a very cold, cold climate. And and yeah, your ability to kind of translate that and understand that, you know, you've yeah. basically flipped it over. You, it's something which was working in the in the cold, dark of winter. You have flipped and using during the warmer. Yeah long daylights of summer um, to be able to, to grow effectively, which is, a, which is a, a really great ability, to obviously, to have read into the context and understand your conditions. And um, The way he explained stuff really made a lot of sense to me. He said, you put one cover over it and you go, you go further north, basically. Well, for over there it was further south, I suppose. But you go a climate zone further north. So, mm -hmm. so when you think about it here, if we're just just above the frost and then we put a cover over it then we're, we're going sort of more up towards the sunshine coast <laughs> you know and if you were to put a cover inside yep then you're probably going to head even further north up to bowen or something you know i just thought to me that really hit home i thought that's amazing but then there was the, the fact that it kept the rain off as well so you know last year Last year was the first year that we ever turned we've ever turned a profit through the summer. So our goal was always to pay everybody's mm -hmm. wages and pay the bills. Um, but now, and it was quite a wet summer last year, and we turned a profit. So that was that was very satisfying. Yeah, and I take your hats off to it because I, I that's one thing which I've I actually I haven't tackled an, enough in 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 chatting with a lot of farmers in the southern hemisphere, but at least down in in Australia, in, in the majority of the country where it's where you can essentially grow in every season, almost all farmers here really are four season farmers. There are some farmers which you know, yep. you know might put yep. their beds to rest, so you know cover cropping for half a year or whatnot. But the majority really are farming nonstop, and like you said, the holding on to labour really pushes and pushes a lot of growers. First of all, one, there can be a lot of burnout for the managers like yourself who are needing a break, but also it, it does push for innovation because, like you said, when, when, you, when you find a good staff member and they, you know, a lot of them end up becoming friends and part of the family, you want to be able to hold them on. So I, I love hearing about, and I'd love to you to hear more about how, you, how you've done that, how you've managed to bridge those seasons and and that's a you know take your hat off because you know exactly making a profit in your in your big season is one thing but turning a profit in your in your harder season that's yeah. really amazing yeah and it's something we've had to do too because we're like a hundred percent of our sales almost a hundred percent of our sales are the markets now so it's very important to maintain that presence there but the flip side of that mm. is that anything you can get in the summer you can sell so because there is a scarcity, so there's always a flip side. Like, um, yeah, I think that's that's so important in farming as well, mate. Is that you know what's not an advantage can be turned into an advantage. You know, like when we had the drought, the dams were getting really empty. Uh, we pumped, started pumping them out one at a time, and it's like, okay, well we can clean the dams out now. We can make them bigger. So it's like, you know what I mean. You've always got to turn this negative thing into a positive thing somehow. Well, I like it because you were, we, you know, when we were opening up and having a chat at the beginning, you were saying how so much of what, you know, what you want to share, and I'm, I'm, I'm supposing this is something you share with a lot of the growers, the young growers that are joining your team, is that mindset is a massive part of the job of the farmer. You know, the technical skills, you can come, you can learn them, but it, the mindset to persevere, which is essentially a lot of the story that you've been sharing is about just pushing on and, yeah. and working out, you know, working out what yeah. works. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of things, you know, I, I met a guy who used to work for us the other day and he said, oh, I remember he used to say to me, slow growth is good growth. And I said, yeah, I still say that today. Like I always, you know, it brings you back down to, 
to reality because we're actually opening up another four acres out the in a, in another spot on the farm. Are you are you currently farming on how, how many acres? Uh, we got about seven acres, I suppose. It would probably be close to three hectares, maybe you know seven and a half. Yeah. Um, and and because we're growing and always changing, a lot of that land's full. Like all winter, it's full. In the summer, we cut back our operation to probably half the size. Uh, it's like a war zone. You just got to decide what you're going to hold on to because with that summer rainfall, the weeds are just unbelievable, mate. Like, yeah, they're crazy. <laughs> you just can't. Well, in the summer, you can't just go out with your hand tools and weed stuff. Like, you've actually got to remove the weed. If you leave it laying on the beds, it'll grow again. It'll just shoot again. So that's subtropics for you, you know. Everything just wants to grow. Um, the grass will get up over your head. They're like, it's crazy. Hey, you all. Just jumping in here real quick to give a shout out to our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers. This site is the lifeblood of our work, and we appreciate so much the support. It makes things like this small series possible and just generally enables us to keep our work free and open to anyone and everyone. We can pay our creators for their work and then keep giving that work away for free. If that's something you believe in, please consider pitching in a few bucks at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Also, there's some perks there, like first dibs and discounts on merch, books, events we do in the future, and at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Stephen Smith, Veggie Cropper, Scott Snodgrass, and Jean-Martin Fortier. Big thanks to anyone and everyone who supports our work in any way that you can. Check out notillgrowers.com slash support for all of our support opportunities. All right, back to the show. Yeah, getting back to yeah, slow growth is good growth. So we don't. It's it's okay to it's okay to pull back. Like it's okay to grow a bit more. And I think a lot of people get stuck in that mindset. Like you got to grow, you got to grow. So you, you can push out, but if it becomes uncomfortable, you, you can pull back. And then, and that's what I realised. This farm here, or all farms are like an organism, organism, and the farm kind of breathes with summer. And winter, like it grows in the winter, it pushes out and we fill everything up. And in the summer, we have to pull it back because we can't hold it, we can't manage it all. You know what I mean? So you have to, you've got to pick what's going to make the money and you've got to, um, you, your greenhouses become prime real estate that you have to um, make them make make them as profitable as possible. Mm, it's like that, that flip, that fl- Business flexibility is super important. That's right. In, in, yeah, in managing, like you said, and you, you guys have that. If it is as hard as you're saying, like it seems like it is a real challenge over those summer months. Like it just seems like a great tactic that like you're saying. You know, if things are getting out of hand, don't try to burn yourself out. Come back to basics. Hold the fort and basically just um, hold the fort and and plan plan to release again. You know what I mean? Like just wait, wait, and get everything ready to go again. And then make the most of it. So when we hit when we hit autumn, you know, because we do all our own seedlings, we do about I don't know, ten to twenty thousand seedlings a week, most of the year. And um, that that seedling house, you know, while it's raining and wet in the summer, we're ordering our seed in and we're getting things ready. And the seedling house is full as soon as we hit that mid March and. You know the ground's getting ready, and we just jump into it. So tell me about tell me about the like you said you are you're slowly expanding another four acres, and also I, I really wanted to chat about your fertility management. And I noticed that you said you guys were relying a lot more on a lot more on compost as as a as a fertility. Yeah. And also I saw on your socials, which I thought was super cool, is is you're using a really awesome compost spreader that I wanted to hear a bit about. Actually, look, let's start with the fertility. Let's start there. I'm interested to hear about use of the compost. Fertility, I've changed so much over the years. I remember when I first started, I used to say to my wife, we're, we're going to be minimalist. I don't want to use inputs. <laughs> and um, and then that soon changed. A lot of the ground here wouldn't grow decent veg. We couldn't grow, honestly, because it's a red red pozzolic, a, like a red volcanic soil, It's a, which is great, and it's great drainage, but it but it um, doesn't hold a lot of nutrients. And with the rainfall, a lot of it used to just wash away. I remember like hauling it back up the hill because we're on slopes, you know. 
So we've used massive amounts of compost and the soil's actually like a chocolate colour now. We've used so much and the, the particles are really sticky and even in high rain, providing my drains are cleaned out. I can run, like I run most of my rows down the hill because I, I treat, we treat the, um, the rows a bit like the roof of a house, you know. If, when I used to run them across the hill, they'd break from one furrow into the other and then cause this massive washout. So the steeper the land is, I just limit the length more. I won't go over 30 metres on 20, 20 degrees and I might go uh, up to 50, 50 metres on, on just a gentle slope. So we sort of learned over time what we can, what we can push. Um, I did very little soil testing for many, many years. Uh, I still don't do a lot, but now and then if I have a problem in an area, I'll do a soil test. But we know that our ground's um, um, low in boron. I'll look for limiting factors. That's why I do a soil test, just to make sure that there's nothing missing. Okay, so, and, and so a part of your shift to what was the impetus for moving into compost? So you're saying before, were you, were you cover cropping to maintain that fertility and then you shifted into compost? Uh, well, I basically did, I did a TAFE course and, and um, I remember... I remember just thinking, well, really, we just need rock phosphate, potassium sulfate, lime, and compost. And then if we if we find out what the limiting factors are, what, what's missing, we put that on. So if it's boron, we put boron on. But I thought that was quite simple in the early days, you know, to get, to get my head around. And we used to just put six buckets of compost on per row. Um, a 40 metre row. We used to have terrible nematodes in the sweet potatoes, but within six months they were gone. I've never seen them again. And as as time rolled on and we could afford it, I thought, well, we'd we'll just give back, and I, I'd, I'd spend more on compost and put more on, and and I just never saw anything but good news. Like the soil just got better. The soil life was better, you know. This, what I'd plough back into the soil would just break down. I could I could plough trash in and it'd be gone in two weeks. Big strings of fungi would be consuming it, and, and the we just did better. The, you know, with the high rainfall, the more compost I put in, the, the beds didn't seem to be so soggy, and in the dry times, they held the moisture better. So. And then what happened was we were putting so much on, we were just wearing workers out. We, we had a little four-wheel drive Suzuki. I could fit 16 buckets in the back because we had to haul everything 200 metres up the hill because mm. we didn't have a decent road back then. And the pack house was way down the hill, about 40 metres in height down the hill, 300 metres away. Everything had to be hauled up, the workers, the vegetables, everything. And... Um, and then we got a, a Toyota troop carrier and I think I could get 38 buckets or something in that and then we progressed on to an old Hilux ute and we got 50 buckets or 48 buckets on that. And then we got our first tractor with a bucket on the front and we used to load, because we loaded all the buckets with the shovel. But then I had a, a front-end loader bucket on the tractor and we, we had square buckets sitting in the ute so that we could just load them with the end loader. So that was amazing. And then, so someone would go down and fill up the ute and then when it arrived, we'd hear it coming up the hill because we'd be doing other jobs and then we'd all, when it, when it got here, we'd all dive on and put out these buckets of compost, 20 litre buckets by hand and pour them on the beds. But we were very limited um, by how many rows we could get ready in a day. And with our wet summers, you might only get a window of one or two days of sunshine in the in the summer. So if if you can't get beds ready, that that really limits um, you know how how much production you're going to get. So I ended up importing a Mill Creek spreader from America. And I saw the videos of it throwing out all this compost, and I thought, oh. If I could put this chute on the back, I reckon it'll all just drop down behind this machine. <laughs> so 
So I had a look at all the specs on all the different models and tried to work out what would fit over my row. And I imported this uh, Mill Creek spreader and I put a 44-gallon drum, I cut it in half and tech screwed it onto the back. <laughs> and I went out and filled it up and and it was just amazing, mate. I, I, put, I did a 40-metre bed in like three minutes. <laughs> you did your test run and you were just, I could imagine the smile on your face. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> so we went from, um, we went from, well, how many beds can we get ready in in the two days of sunshine to, you know, how many beds do you want? Yeah, it's a, it's amazing how there can be a, just a couple of, you know, I don't think tools are always the, the, the make or break of a, of, a, of, a, of a good or a bad farm, definitely not, but it is amazing how there are a couple of implements that you can invest in and their, their return on investment is just mind-blowing, hey? Yeah, well, I'm on my second one now. Uh, I wore out the first spreader and this one's well on the way. <laughs> And um, <laughs> so that's uh, that's that's the main thing. But the reason I'm opening up this other block of land is that because we've always got this area full, and what happens is, yeah, you, you seem to open up more land so that you can do cover crops and green manures, and then you do it less and less because you've got so much pressure to produce that you're not. There's no room for them anymore. <laughs> So I've expanded a few times, and each time I do, I, I always say, oh, we're just expanding so that we can do cover crops. It's not because we're getting bigger. But then but then we always end up filling it all up with vegetables over a number of years. And, yeah. But the, the idea of this new block is that I've actually been thinking about this for a year, few years, but I want to get crops like sweet potatoes and pumpkins and melons and broccoli which we do and can never do enough of them out of this intensive system because I find that they create too much weed problems and they they really lend themselves better to be worked with the tractor and they're kind of like they should be on a different farm and I heard mm. I'm sure I heard something like that in a podcast the other day yeah, I think it was you yeah it was you talk well it's really nice you're hearing because it, it, it was an observation of that kind, it popped into my head not long ago, so I'm really excited to hear you kind of explore that a bit more because you're right. When you're, when you're growing intensively, there are some crops which don't doesn't match up as well in the intensive cropping area. Yeah. I sort of call them uh, Lockyer Valley crops because that's, you know, the Lockyer Valley. It's all the stuff they grow up there and we grow some of them here, but yeah. they just don't fit into this in with all the, all the herbs and the leafy green bunches and stuff like that. And then when I heard you say it on that podcast, I was like, oh, you're thinking the same thing. That's interesting. Maybe I'm on the right track, you reckon? I picked these themes up from growers like yourself, <laughs> so I'm not taking credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny how, though, a lot of growers end up with very similar bed widths and just different, you know, like I look at yeah. websites and, videos of people on the other side of the world and and you you end up with a lot of similarities um, in the way you run your farm yeah it's nice that it's nice to kind of think that there's obviously some i guess the the, the longer you're in the game and I, I won't necessarily say you know the exactly not not the big or the more successful but it's success from the sense that you've, you're still growing and you're still out there with a smile on your face but along the way like you said you do refine those processes and yeah yeah, I guess there seems to, there are some practices which just work, and because they work, they flourish across the board. Whether you're you're in a subtropic climate or a, a temperate whatever, or wherever you are in the world, so it's 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 nice. It's nice like that. And there's so much gear and so many things now. I mean, I, I watched a fair bit of YouTube a couple of years ago, and then I went out and bought all this stuff that I'd seen and brought it home, and and I tried a couple of things, and because we you know we're under the pump and we're such a flat out farm. And a lot of it ended up going straight back into the shed. Tanya said, well, you buy all this stuff and then you you don't even use it. I said, well, I just can't. I can't. I bought too much of it and, and I can't fit it all into my system. I don't have the time to refine it. So I just went back to the old Earthway Garden Cedar and put the jang back away. And <laughs> paper pot transplanter was like, oh, I'm having troubles with that. You're going to have to do them by hand. And... <laughs> 
you know what I mean? Because it's all very well to get these things, but if they don't transfer easily into your busy operation, you're probably better off just doing one at a time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And like you said, there can be one new tool that you get. It's got all the promise of the world. Like, you know, just say it's the paper pot transplant. And before you know it, you've, you're needing to change some pretty fundamental elements of your, your bed spacing or your bed prep just to make this tool work when maybe your old your old method was almost almost as good but it's not worth the hassle of, of you know overhauling everything you've yeah. learned over the years but we are at a point now with seedlings that uh, it's a bit like a, I was telling you about the compost you know we're wearing people out and, and seedlings are almost just, you get that little bit bigger and yeah you, you, you just those sort of jobs are hard they're hard on people's backs well, you guys, it's well. You guys have gotten to that scale, like you're saying. Like, it's interesting. A lot of the growers that we we have on the on the show, and at least you know, when we think of small scale growers, in in the big picture of things, you're yeah, you're a small scale grower compared to the majority, the average size vegetable operation in Australia. But for the small scale farming scene, already hitting six to ten acres is actually perceived by a lot of growers as actually a large operation. So it's nice hearing, you know, like you're saying that it does get to a point where switching your system becomes kind of critical because the like you said the the monotony of a certain task when you get to a certain scale demands some sort of mechanization to make it palatable or doable or or maybe like you said there's that tipping point of efficiency where you're like well I've I've actually you know I I could haul buckets up a hill in the early stages but now I can't or which is interesting so uh, what so what's the plan are you thinking of doing some small mechanizations in your, in your greenhouse operation uh the main thing is well yeah we've done that as well in our greenhouses we we um we're doing broad forking and um a little tilter thing and and then i started to get tennis elbow from the tilter and then the broad fork was just too slow and then I had an old tractor that I'd retired, like it was the first tractor I ever owned, a little 18 horsepower Iseki. And I went into the um, tractor place to get some bits and they had a little 90 centimetre wide rotary hoe out the front. And I said, oh, what's the story with that? And he said, oh, I've ordered it in for someone and they don't want it anymore. I can do you a good price. I said, yeah, I've got just a job for that. And um, I ended up, using that instead of the tilter and we just run it a bit you know we just don't drop it to full depth and then i thought this is just so good so i got on gumtree and bought another little tractor the same for 2800 bucks and i run a three three time chisel plow on the back of it and i can run five rows and we we built the uh, greenhouses so they can sneak the tractors through and it's so good now, mate. Like if I want to take out a row, we we just we just chop it and rip it and jump from one tractor to the other. It's so fast. Yeah, the maneuverability, and it's nice also like reflecting on what you're saying is that also, you know, you're not you're not putting yourself in a box. Like I already you you've shared that you know you're using a tractor when it's appropriate. It's you know you you were using a tilter when it was appropriate. Um, a walk behind, which is which is like you said that that flexibility. Obviously, when you've you've been in the game for long enough as well, and you're purchasing things, you're paying them off. You have that ability to invest in in, in different tools and and see what works in your system. And it's really important to make do with what you got in the start. You know, like we never. There's so many things I can talk about, mate. But like when when I said I had to go away and work, we were so broke when we set up these sweet the first sweet potato block. I used hail net that I got from free for free when I was picking fruit in Batlow because it tore when they got a, a massive hailstorm. And I used that for the fence, just hail net. I strung it up and I went around all the farm and pulled out every steel post I could find because I couldn't afford to build a fence. Uh, we were literally, you know, on our last legs when I put those sweet potatoes in. And... Um, so everything on our farm, all our pack houses and sheds and greenhouses and irrigation and every tractor I own and my truck, you know, to the market, it amazes me, mate. Like, it's all come from the soil. It's all come from this farm. Yeah, I'm sure it gives an amazing, like, amazing appreciation when you when you are walking walking around at the end of the day. Yeah, it blows me away that, you know, nature can do, do that if you do, you know, 
with your work with nature and it provides so much. It's incredible. Yeah, no, it really, it really is amazing. I think one one thing I've a real amazing takeaway from the the conversation with you as well is that you know before having the conversation with you, I could have easily looked over your website and 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 over your your, your socials with you know there's beautiful crops and it's you know the, it, everything looks so perfect and you you forget you know you can easily kind of say oh you know that person's you know they've got the perfect system and it's working so smoothly and we forget that it's all it's like you said it's all it's all baby steps you know we've all got to come from a certain place and you've put the hard yards in and, and that's what it is it's about it's about having that long perspective being patient um and just uh and, ch- and chipping away which is what you guys did so you know big t- take my hat off to you for that yeah and, and the other thing is too and i must mention that you know, a lot of our success has come from the fact that ten and i have got we like we we dovetail together like She's got all the skills that I don't, and I've got all the skills she doesn't have. And we've both got skills that we each have, but, um, you know, and and we're both ridiculously crazy mad about farming. Like, you know, we'll have dinner and then start talking work. (laughs) But we do love, we do love what we do. And, um, yeah, we're tragic farmers, really. (laughs) <laughs> it's always a thrill the thrill of the thrill of um what you can grow and how good it looks and yeah we love it it's exciting for someone like me because you know i'm i'm relatively young in in the growing space of of you know in in farming myself and you know like you said there there are days where it's super hard and 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 you know i do chat with a lot of farmers and it's not all it's not all rosy but it's it really is warming chatting with someone like yourself who like you said, you've been growing for a long time, and you still get a real, like a real kick out of it. And from what I, from what I'm seeing, you guys are you're getting better every year. You know, the demand for your crops is only growing, which is reflecting in you guys, obviously. You know, slow, slowly growing your farm, um, and that's really like that's that's really awesome to 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 see. Like that's I think a lot of the younger growers coming in, we we need a, a reality check of what farming is in many ways. Specifically, a lot of the people coming from the now generation. Um, a reality of check of what what the hard yards you're going to put in to, to be successful, um, but also you know you, it's not all doom and gloom. There are so many moments of of joy, like you're sharing, and 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 That's work right. for a lot of us. It's not really work. It's it's a lifestyle which which gets us out of bed. We love it. Yeah, and and the the things that aren't so nice they they make you stronger, and then they're never easy. It's it's never easy to get wiped out by hail or a flood, um, and it doesn't get easier. But you, but you know that you've done it before, and you know you can survive. And I keep saying to a lot of people, like farming's, it's about turning up. It's the relentless turning up. You know, like you have to get up, and you've got to get out there, and you've got to, you got to do what you've got to do. And if if you if you're reliable and consistent, and you keep turning up, then you just get better at it. And then it gets easier because you break through and you start to earn a little bit and then and then you can start to choose what you'd like to grow and that's when it gets really fun because, you know, like my wife's uh, growing flowers now and, and she's like, I don't care if I don't make money out of flowers, I just want to grow flowers. You know what I mean? Like that's the first time we've been able to do something like that. Yeah. Um, and... and I'm opening up this new block of land and I'm really enjoying um, opening up that land and being able to build the right fence and put the irrigation in the way I'd like it um, and and opening up land when I know what I'm doing now. (laughs) Whereas before we didn't know what the hell we were doing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so you got to have a project and that's what keeps you interested. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, and I'm sure you're having a lot of fun with a lot of some of the um, the young guns coming through, and to be able to share that knowledge that you've gained over the years with them, and then and then seeing them. We've always done that, and some of the guys that have worked here are doing really well now. Um, they they've moved on and doing their own thing, and we've always taken TAFE students through. Like for 30 years, I've had the TAFE groups come through, and I show them the farm. And to me, that's really important. Like the industry has been really good to us, and. Uh, it's really important to give back because 
yeah, you know, we don't. If we can help others out, it's a good thing, mate. Because it's it's hard. It's hard to start farming. You got all the land, the cost of land, and um, you know, like like you you imagine the cost of land, and you get up, and all the all the running costs, and then you get hit with hail. Like we can get hit with hail now. Once you're established, you know, you should have enough in the bank to, to, to survive a hail and a flood. But when you're starting out, you don't have that luxury. You know, I make sure that we're covered. When you're starting out, you can't do that. And the beautiful thing about compost, it's like money in the bank. Because when we got wiped out with a flood in the early days, and we put a lot of time into our soil and a lot of compost and a lot of effort, and we got hit particularly badly and I couldn't afford compost for 18 months and we grew lettuces just as good as any year. It's not like chemical inputs, you know, you, you pull the rug out from under your crops and they they don't perform. Yeah, exactly. You build that you build that base over the years and, and it, it returns it returns that favour in a sense. Um, when you look after it, it returns in a very different way than exactly conventional farming. It's actually funny how I got a hold of you and how I actually heard of you was actually related to your lettuces. I'd actually having a chat with Jody Roebuck who'd visited your farm, and Jody said that the lettuces that he saw on your farm were some of the the most the, some of the largest, most luscious lettuces he'd ever seen. He said you, you've got to give him a call and have a yarn with him. <laughs> yeah, it blew him away. He was. He's like, because he does a lot of salad mixes and stuff, and he's like, God, how many kilos are in that? <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly how many kilos in a single head of lettuce. <laughs> he, he couldn't believe we were selling them per piece because he does everything um, by the by the kilo. And, but uh, he's a great guy, Jody. He, yeah. um, I, I only had I had him out one afternoon. A friend of mine, where he works. Um, he came came to visit there. I think they were doing a, a farming seminar or something out there. And and he rang up. He said, "Can I bring JD out?" And I said, "Yeah, bring him out." You know, because I didn't know who he was. And then, like, well, like you know, when you meet other growers, like you start conversation at this whole other level. And uh, before you knew it, it was getting dark, and it was like, "Is we better we better knock off?" You know, there's so much to talk about and so many ideas and. <laughs> you know, he helped me out with a couple of problems I was having in the microgreens, and, and I answered a few questions. And he said, "Oh, I got to try that," you know, and that was really good. Just that sharing again, and those networks is so important. Well, mate, I wanted to um on that note on on sharing, just want to thank you for obviously taking the taking the time. I've I've had an absolute ball just having a having a yarn with you, and it's it's been super refreshing. Um, as I said, I'll be, I'll be carrying this conversation with me for a while, just thinking about you know. How I how I you know take the next steps in my journey and that I really like the idea set of of you know taking it slow, being patient, a lot of reality checks and 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 also just just remembering that there is a whole lot of passion in there. So making sure that I'm I'm keeping that passion alive and and um, that's the that's the important part. Yeah, I think the day the day you don't have the passion, you know, like obviously there's moments where things aren't so easy, but. When when the hard times over, if the passion doesn't return, I, I think it's time to get out, and uh, I think I'll be in it for a long time yet. Well, I hope so, matey. And um, once once the um, once COVID's a distant thought, I'll be um, I'll be jumping in the car with my partner Kez, and um, and we'll I'll, I'll I'll nick up the hill, and um, and I'm looking forward to having some coffee. So I hope you still got some growing around. That'd be awesome. Oh, I got some pretty good coffee, but I don't grow it now, but. I found a pretty good coffee, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. As long as we have a, we can we can sit out in the field, have a natter, have a couple of couple of couple of coffees, and um, I'm looking forward to that. Sounds awesome. No, I'm looking forward to it too, Mike. It sounds really good, mate. All right, if you enjoyed that show and you're enjoying our Southern Hemisphere series in general, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links as well as how to follow our guest and our host, Mikey Densham. Consider signing up to be a patron at patreon.com slash no-till growers or just check out no-till growers.com for more ways to support our work. 
This episode was produced by Mikey Dinsham with help from No Toll Growers. Big thanks to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.